Hello um, and welcome to this mini lecture on sounds of the 70s. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Joe Hicks and I'm a lecturer in the Department of Music. I'm also the programme director for the MMUS in music. So that means I have an oversight and I look after um, how the master's course works. And it's a lovely chance this morning um, for me to give you a little sample of some of the, the work, some of the ideas that we talk about in this course. And then more importantly, there'll be time at the end for, for you to ask any questions. Those questions might be about the 70s, they might be about this mini lecture, or they might be about the master's course more generally. So um, sit back, enjoy uh, this bonus little lecture on the sounds of the 70s, and then please feel free to ask any questions as you go along. You've probably seen a message already in the chat that says you can write uh, your messages at any point. You don't need to wait for the end. Um, I'll look at them when we get to the end uh, and then try and answer those questions as best I can. I'll say this now. I'll try and remember to say it at the end as well. If you're watching this video and you want to get in touch with me, uh, please do so. You can find my contact details online via the the Department of Music webpage. So it's jonathan.hicks at abdn.ac.uk. And that applies if you're watching this video live, but also if you're watching this video on YouTube or you find it via the university website um, and you're watching it later on, please get in touch with me as well. I'm always happy to speak to people who are interested in the master's course and of course, who are interested in the 1970s. So, the sounds of the 70s. What are we going to be talking about in this lecture? Well, let me begin by giving you a little context. Um, as you know, the context for this mini lecture is the master's course, the MMUS in music. Um, so this is a master's course that's not just for people who are interested in the 1970s. You don't have to love ABBA to do the master's in music here at Aberdeen. We've got study paths, as you can see, in six different areas. So in community music, in composition, in music education, musicology, performance and sonic arts. One of the features of our MMUS in music is that we have a number of students who will combine different interests. So that might be music educators interested in performance. It might be sonic artists interested in musicology. It might be performers who are also composers, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. We're really open to finding a way to make this master's course suit the different interests, skills, abilities and career plans of music students. So if that's something that you're unsure about, how could I find my path through this course? please get in touch. You can you can ask a question today or you can write to me and we can always have a chat. This particular particular lecture is um, is a small part of a class that we run in a course called music research skills. So everyone who takes the master's course, uh, regardless of your study path, will take this course called music research skills, which, as you'd imagine, is an opportunity to think about different ways of doing music research, different approaches, different methods. Now, today's focus is going to be largely on musicology. That's because I'm a musicologist. That's uh, where, where I put a lot of the emphasis in, in my own work. But I should stress that the music research skills course is really for everybody, regardless of your different interests. So the class we had yesterday was on contemporary performance, thinking about um, new music and composers and self-governing ensembles and the economics of the music business from lots of different perspectives, whether as a music teacher, performer, composer, etc. So it's not just about musicology, but within this course, uh, we, ha we have a class thinking about the 1970s. Um, so why think about the 1970s? It's not because it's a uniquely important decade. In fact, it's quite arbitrary. But what we do in this course is take the 1970s and we say, what are all the different points of reference we have? So we ask the students to go away and research just a small part of what they know, what they're interested in from the music of the 1970s. And that could be anything. It might be that you're interested in an idea from music pedagogy of the time. It might be you're interested in uh, production techniques from the 1970s. It might be that you're interested in disco and fashion. It might be that you're interested in the Eurovision Song Contest. Who knows? The idea is that everyone goes off, brings together their different sounds of the 1970s, and then we share. We create our own mini anthology of the sounds of the 70s. That's the first part 
of the class. And in a way, this lecture is me uh, kind of demonstrating myself what would normally be done as a collective project with different students bringing in different ideas. And I'll explain that in just a second. So this is the outline for this lecture. Now we've got some context of where it fits in. So we're thinking about how to study the sounds of the 70s. Um, it doesn't matter if this is your main area of interest there's no exam on the 1970s that's not the point it's an opportunity to ask how questions what methods do we use in music research what approaches can we take um i've got three for you today we could have many others you might be sitting there thinking you've got different priorities for the 1970s that's fine i'm going to talk about these three things that you can see uk album sales so how might study in uk album sales be a way into thinking about the sounds of the 70s I'm then going to talk about Portuguese politics, which will make sense, I promise. And there's a very particular story of the interaction of recorded music, broadcast music and Portuguese politics to think about there. And then finally, I'm going to think about outer space. So if we're moving from the UK and then thinking um, more broadly about a European context, I then want to go really big. And the last example of sounds of the 70s will be intergalactic quite quite literally so i'll give you these three little snapshots uh, different ways of thinking about the 70s and then ask the following question then what what do we do with all this diverse information how do we make sense of diversity how do we make sense of musical plurality um, and that's really the second part of the class when we run it in the masters it's not just going away and researching finding things out it's what you do next how do we consider making connections? How do we understand the relationships between what might seem very different kinds of music? And that is a research skill. That is a method and approach um, that we try to develop. Um, so without further ado, let me begin with our first little case study. The best selling albums of the 1970s in the UK. Um, if we were doing this in the class, I might say, have a guess. What do you think were the best selling albums of the UK? And I reckon there's a decent chance some of you would have got some of these. Um, so you can probably recognise one or two from the covers. Uh, we've got Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, which was actually the eighth best selling album. Uh, we've got ABBA's Arrival, uh, seventh best selling. Mike Oldfield's Tubular Bells was the third best selling. And uh, by a country mile, Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Water was the best selling album of the 1970s. Now, I don't know if you if you guessed that, if you knew that, but I'd imagine you might expect that when we're studying the music of the 1970s, we might be studying albums. We might be studying these works of art in the field of popular music by recognized performers. Um, but if we look at the data, if we look at what's sold most, the story gets a little bit more complicated. So, Here's four more of the top 10 best selling albums from the 1970s. Uh, so you can see on the left, we've got The Carpenters, a collection of singles from 1969 to 1973. That was the sixth best selling album of the 1970s in the UK. Um, we've then got uh, an Elvis, 40 Greatest Hits, came in at number 10, ABBA's Greatest Hits uh, at number two, and then Simon and Garfunkel's Greatest Hits at number four. So there's a theme here. Actually, an awful lot of the albums sold in the 1970s weren't new music by artists. They were collections. They were greatest hits. So what does this suggest? What kind of questions might follow from this information? Well, maybe when we're thinking about music history and when we're thinking about how to study the music of a decade, we don't only have to study what's new. We can also study what was popular at the time, but had been around for, for a good while. Now, in some cases, this music hadn't been around for all that long. The Carpenters singles only go back to 1969. But Elvis, well, Elvis's greatest hits point us back to the 1950s and the persistence of an interest in music from the 1950s well into the 70s. Let me give you the missing two records from this hit parade of the decade. Um, and that will actually continue the theme of an interest in the 50s. So here we go. As you can see on the, the right hand side, the soundtrack to Greece was actually 
um, the ninth best selling album in the 1970s in the UK. So this is newly composed music, but it's newly composed music that isn't written by um, famous pop or rock stars. It's written for a musical that's turned into a film. And perhaps that's not the first thing we think about when we think about new music in the 1970s. You might not immediately think about what's on Broadway and then what's turned into a major motion picture by Hollywood studios, but this is what people were buying. And this is what people were listening to at home. So what kinds of stories, what kinds of contexts or narratives will help us make sense of what people were actually listening to and actually spending their, their cash on in the 1970s? Likewise, Saturday Night Fever. Sure, we can tie this into a narrative about the emergence of disco. Um, we can talk about the success of the Bee Gees as breakout stars who helped to popularise disco beyond um, its kind of origins in the you know, east coast of the US. Um, but this is also another example of a soundtrack. So we're starting to see not just albums that are made as a kind of work of art by um, by pop stars or rock stars. We also have greatest hits collections that are put out by record labels to, to make a lot of money from their back catalogue. And then we have these soundtrack collections. So this is an important way that people are listening to music by relating it to other art forms, to movies, to shows. And, um, and then the last obvious connecting point here is John Travolta. So if I'd said to you at the beginning, who do you think is the key figure in, in the music of the 1970s? Would you have said John Travolta? Would he have jumped out as a, as a thread that connects the listening habits of, of UK album buyers um, in this time? I don't know, maybe you would, but it strikes me that by using this kind of information, we can pose questions that will help us shape the way we approach the music of this decade and the narratives we might be interested in telling. Uh, and to suppose to, to underscore this same point in a different way, I think we might have some preconceived ideas about the music of the 70s and what's new and what's exciting and what music history might tell. And, um, and I bet your ideas don't include Perry Como. So Perry Como, if you don't know, very famous Italian-American recording artist. Uh, he signed with a record label, RCA, in 1943, and then went on to have, you know, a decades, decades long career. Uh, he had the kind of longevity that Cliff Richard has. You know, there's a there's a point of comparison there, if you will. Now, in the 70s, he had very high selling records. He had a, a greatest hits collection and he had his 21st studio album, 21st no less, and I Love You. Both of these albums, his greatest hits and his 21st studio album, And I Love You, sold more records than some of the best known artists that we talk about now from the 70s, like David Bowie or like the Sex Pistols. So even though we might conventionally tell our stories of music history by picking the artists that seem most innovative, most cutting edge, by talking about punk, by talking about glam, by talking about Bowie and the Sex Pistols. Actually, they didn't shift anywhere near as many albums as Perry Como. So how do we talk about this guy in the context of the 1970s? How do we talk about the 70s and this decade as a time when crooners flourished? Um, I don't have the answers to that, but by using this source of information, by using this chart and then seeing the kinds of um, surprises it throws up, it encourages us to ask questions about the way we study music. And remember, this is a snapshot from a course about music research skills and methods. It's all about the how questions. What are we looking for? What questions can we ask? So that's our first little case study on UK album sales in the 1970s. That's a way of thinking about the music of this decade, very empirical, based on sales, based on charts, based on numbers that you, you can't argue with. Now we're going to shift focus a bit. Why am I showing you a mural from Portugal? Um, well, if any of you here are, are, are Portuguese or are familiar with Portuguese history, you'll be very familiar with this date. So it says Viva o 25 Abril or Long Live the 25th of April. And the 25th of April is something like an Independence Day in Portugal. It's a national holiday and it marks um, a period of a revolution 
um, and, and huge political change from the middle of the 1950s. Also, if, if you're Portuguese or if you're familiar with Portuguese culture, you would instantly recognize these two flowers that are being drawn here in a very famous, very stylized fashion rather. So these are carnations or cravos. Um, now, why do we have a mural celebrating the 25th of April from the middle of the 1970s? Why do we have carnations? Bear with me a little bit. We will get to the music, but you need, I think, to understand this story to know first a bit about the political context. So um, by the middle of the 1970s, Portugal had been had been ruled by a, a series of, of authoritarian right wing, very conservative, uh, socially conservative um, administrations and governments uh, for the best part of 50 years. Um, and in 1974, there was uh, a military coup which led to uh, a revolutionary process. This wasn't immediate that then um, arrived at the, the democratic state of Portugal that we know today. So this is similar in, in many ways to the situation in, in Spain, where the end of Franco's regime resulted in a, a move towards democracy, similar to the story in Greece as well. In the case of Portugal, after the reign of Salazar, and then he dies, and there's a, a replacement leader very much in the authoritarian vein named Caetano. Um, and then it's at this point in 1974 when there's a pushback. Now, those names aren't super important. Um, you just need to know that this is a time of huge political upheaval and popular protest. And this is an image that you are seeing. Uh, now, some of these armed figures belong to the armed forces movement, the Movimento das Forças Armadas, or the MFA, who led the military coup to depose the authoritarian regime. The eagle-eyed among you may also spot that they have flowers on their rifles. They have carnations on their guns. Now, according to the mythology of the Carnation Revolution, as it's known, barely a shot was fired. Portugal managed to go from dictatorship to democracy through peace and through floristry. That narrative has been slightly exaggerated. People did die in this transition. There were shots fired. There was violence, but it was on the whole and compared to other transitions, remarkably peaceful. And there were indeed flowers distributed and placed on guns, on tanks as a symbol of uh, a kind of popular non-military support for this military coup that eventually turned into a, a civil change of government. OK, that's a little bit of potted history about Portuguese politics from the middle of the 1970s. Maybe you're familiar with that. It's a famous story if you know it. Maybe you're not. What's it got to do with music? What's it got to do with recorded sound? Actually, rather a lot. So this is Paulo de Carvalho uh, in the Eurovision Song Contest from 1974. The Eurovision Song Contest this year predated the uh, the revolution in April. So uh, this guy is known as singing a popular song. Again, he's a crooner. You know, he's learned from Perry Como um, and he's singing on this um, pop song oriented competition that's broadcast uh, across Europe. Um, and he sings a song called Ida Pushto Deus, so after the farewell. Now, what's this song got to do with the revolution? Well, this was used as a signal for the start of the military coup. So on the 24th of April at five minutes to 11 on a small community run radio station in, in Lisbon called Emissores Associados de Lisboa, this song, the Eurovision hit, and you know, think for yourself if you want a reference point to the kind of Eurovision hits you might know from ABBA, from Cliff Richard, from Sandy Shaw, from Scylla Black, whatever your reference point is. This song was played on the radio station as a secret code for the MFA to begin their military coup. This was the time to start. And then that wasn't the end of the musical cues. We then have uh, we then have José Afonso, um, or Zeco Afonso, as he was best known, and his song, Grandel of Villa Morena. This was played a bit later, so at 20 past midnight on another uh, radio station, Renaissance de Lisboa, this song is played to a much wider audience 
more people listening as a cue again to continue this military coup, to continue the claiming of spaces in the city, in Lisboa, uh, so in Lisbon and in, in Porto and in various other um, significant sites around the country to take control from the existing government. And within a matter of hours after the playing of Grande La Vila Morena on the radio station as a signal to go out and take control, the administration that had been in power for decades had fallen and this peaceful military queue festooned with flowers and initiated by a Eurovision song and this modern folk tune by Zeca Fonsu had in many ways succeeded. Now, in terms of a sound of the 1970s, this is very different from looking at the decade as a whole and measuring exactly how many people went to the shop and paid their money to buy a, a greatest hits record or, or whatever else they were buying. This isn't taking the whole 10 years. This is a much different time frame. This is a musical and political story that focuses on just a few hours either side of midnight on one date, the 25th of April in 1974. So in terms of how we study the sounds of the 70s, not only here do we have a different set of reference points to different political organisations, to different singers, to different competitions with the Eurovision Song Contest, to different genres with this modern folk music um, that's, that's performed and celebrated by Zeca Fonsu, we also have a very powerful story of the binding together of popular song and popular political change. Unsurprisingly, both of these songs have had a very significant afterlife in the Portuguese popular imagination and continue to this day to be widely remembered, widely sung and sometimes sung back at democratic politicians when it's seen that they are not living up to the standards that were imagined in this moment of, of liberation and political change. So a really tight and particular historical connection here between recorded sound broadcast on these radio stations and political change. So once again, a very different take on the sounds of the 70s, involving different questions, encouraging us to look at different kinds of association, different uses of music. Um, but I promised you not just the world, I promised you an intergalactic story, not just the UK, not just Europe. Let's, let's go large. Um, what are you looking at here? This is our third example, um, outer space. You are looking at the golden record. Well, in fact, you're looking at both the golden record and the protective sleeve. So what is this? It's a record. It spins like records you'll be familiar with, just like lots of the records that were sold in the 1970s and went into those charts, just like the records made by Paulo de Carvalho and Zeco Afonso that were used as cues to be played on the radio in that Portuguese um, carnation revolution. But this one is made of solid gold. And it's made of solid gold because it is currently still on a Voyager spacecraft that has gone further and faster out into the galaxy than any other craft before. So this is launched by NASA in the mid 1970s as part of a series of explorations um, on Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. There are two golden records, in fact, that are supposed to be sent out as far as possible into the galaxy and this contains as you can probably just about see if you can read the central circle the sounds of earth so not just the sounds of the 70s but launched in the 1970s by nasa the sounds of earth and then the wonderful uh, writing underneath you may be able to read it says nasa and then says united states of america planet earth um so you know, it's common in the US to say that such and such a city is in this state, you know, New York, New York. Here we have the United States of America, planet Earth. This is supposed to be read by aliens right? and supposed to be heard by aliens. This is the, the grandness of the scheme. So again, to focus on the circle, the, the black circle here, you might just be able to read the writing to the makers of music. Um, to the makers of music, all worlds, all times, 
and then it says side A. So the side A is this sweet little recognition of how this very earthly, domestic, familiar technology works. There's some songs on side A, turn it over for side B, move your needle. But then this incredibly, incredibly grand claim that this is being sent to the makers of music in all worlds and all times. Um, Evidently, our scale of reference has changed here. Yes, this belongs to the 1970s. Yes, it belongs to the United States, but it's being sent into the furthest reaches of the known universe, and it's being imagined as a gift to all sentient life. The cover that you can see on the left with these almost hieroglyphic instructions were intensively designed to be readable by intelligent life, whatever that intelligence might be. Um, an incredible undertaking, of course, um, and it says something about the ambition and status and power of the United States during this decade that they should feel able to project the sounds of the earth from the United States to everywhere. It's a huge, huge sense of power and prestige in this mission. But what's on the record, you might be wondering, because this really is a playable piece of recorded technology. Here's an overview. Um, so there's prestige classical music, three bits of Bach, no one else gets so much, two bits of Beethoven, some Mozart, and then a, a bit of the Rite of, Rite of Spring by Stravinsky. So perhaps you'd expect that with some priority given to, to the most prestigious European classical music, although of course that poses questions about why it's being celebrated by the United States. Um, perhaps surprisingly, there's some pretty niche uh, early music, historically informed performances recorded by, by British musicians, actually, David Munro and, and the Consort of London. And then US popular music is, um, is the category that that is well represented, as you might imagine. So we have Chuck Berry, Louis Armstrong, and Blind Willie Johnson. Um, now, what questions might we ask about this? Why in the 1970s is the US choosing these artists to, to effectively represent US popular music? What does that say about the status of Chuck Berry and Louis Armstrong and Blind Willie Johnson, about the, the histories of jazz and blues and rock and roll in their popular American um, imagination? Um, I say I'm not here to answer these questions, but to use this information to pose them and to suggest how we might um, take different approaches and use different methods when studying the sounds of the 70s. We then have just one example of North American indigenous music, recordings of Navajo Indians, um, as, as these recordings are described in the, in the list that goes with the record. Um, and then a large number of of what we might think of as representative national traditions. So in the way that a large national museum might try to curate the art of the world, in the way that the British Museum will have sections from different geographical areas, so too does this golden record try and capture the sounds of all different places in the world. You can see the list there. Now, is it possible to offer a comprehensive anthology of the sounds of Earth in the 1970s? Well, you certainly have to take a lot of editorial choices. Um, so we have three pieces by Bach and we have one piece of music for China. Um, likewise, two pieces by Mozart, one piece of music for all of India. So this is not an attempt to equally or equitably match up the size of population with the size of musical output. There's lots of decisions being made here about what's valuable, what ought to be included. Um, perhaps decoding these value judgments is no less difficult than decoding the instructions on that golden cover for the as yet undiscovered intelligent life form. So there we go. That's my third example. We've had the UK album sales, we've had the Carnation Revolution and Portuguese politics, and then we've got the golden record. We've got music in outer space that's projected out from the US in the middle of the 1970s as a kind of capsule, a sonic capsule or anthology of what the world sounds like. So those are three very different ways of studying the sounds of the 1970s. But as I pointed out at the beginning, there's this question that comes at the end. And then what? What do we do with these 
three different approaches, these three different mini case studies. And the case studies could be different. These are the ones that I've come up with when we run this class as part of the music research skills course. The case studies, the examples depend on the students. It depends what people want to come and talk about. But then we'll still ask this question. What do we do? How do we make connections between what seem to be not just different genres, but different conceptions of music and different scales of musical influence, if you will? Um, are we talking about a country? Are we talking about a universe and many different scales in between? I'm just going to offer a couple of suggestions about how we might uh, approach plurality and diversity in music studies. So this is a, a, a tiny taster of the way that we use existing writing um, and studies and academic literature to try and inform the way the way we undertake our own research and our own approaches to, to music in this course. So this first article, Elvis and Darmstadt, we've seen Elvis already, another lovely picture of the man there um, printed onto a record. So David Clark, who's a music analyst, music, music theorist based at Newcastle University, um, a while ago published this essay called Elvis and Darmstadt. Now Elvis, I imagine you've heard about, breakout rock and roll star of the 1950s. Um, huge figure in, in the history of American popular music, of course. Now, Darmstadt, you may also have heard about. Darmstadt was a, a school, a training centre for new music, experimental or avant-garde classical music that rose to prominence after the Second World War. Figures like Boulez, figures like Stockhausen were hugely influential in what happened at Darmstadt. Other leading lights of 20th century um, classical composition like John Cage were in attendance, Luciano Berio, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a center of modernist musical experimentation. David Clark's question is what do we do with the fact that in 1957 is the year he chooses, Elvis and Darmstadt were both hugely influential according to different histories of music. If you read a history of popular music, Elvis is changing everything. If you read a history of classical music, Darmstadt is changing everything. If you try and connect the two together, what happens? Is it possible? Do they belong to separate histories? Or is there a way of trying to acknowledge and understand and analyze what David Clark calls cultural pluralism when we're studying music in a given period? Um, now, this may be something that you have ideas about and it would be great to, to hear your thoughts on how we might make connections either between Elvis and Darmstadt or between the case studies I've been giving you. Uh, so for instance, David Clark suggests that technology might be a connecting factor between Elvis, who represents popular music, and Darmstadt that represents this new classical music, both fascinated by by the use of technology, by new recording, by new means of broadcast, by new means of uh, manipulating recorded sound. Now they take different approaches to that, but both very much interested in that. Could Elvis have had a career without a microphone, for instance? Um, we could ask similar questions in regard to the things we've seen from the 1970s. For most of my case studies, I'm talking about records. So I'm talking about this circular thing you can see in front of you that spins. This particular form of musical, um, this particular form of musical object, which we find in the UK album sales, because in the 1970s, it's not digital. It's actual stuff, actual records that are being put in people's hands in return for cash. And then also in the case of the Portuguese politics, this is recorded sound. So Zeco Afonso has many, many times sung this song live since, but at the key moment, either side of midnight on the 25th of April 1974, it was a recording of his song that was played on the radio, just as it was a recording of that Eurovision entry. So recorded sound might be one way of making links between, between the UK, between Portugal, and of course the golden record that's sent out into the world, into the space rather. Um, so the form of music, the objects that we find uh, music in might be one of the ways of making connections. But of course, you might have more ideas. And what I want to convey now is that the master's course provides an opportunity for exploring these questions of how we approach diversity, of how we undertake different kinds of music study, how to pose different questions in order to make 
different connections and understand relationships. One last example that we use in the class, um, Hans Ulrich Gumbrecht uh, wrote a book again quite a long time ago now called In 1926, Living on the Edge of Time. If David Clark was going out of his way to make connections, to understand how we could bring disparate histories together, Gumbrecht took the opposite view. He wrote this book and said, you don't have to read it from beginning to end. This is a book about 1926. Dip in wherever you like, hop around, take your own journey. The last thing I want to do is give you a linear narrative. So he decided to write a book with lots of different sections, some of which is directly relevant to music, listening to the radio, as that was done in 1926, some of which is very different. What was the experience of being in an elevator and worrying about pickpockets in 1926? And so on and so forth. So the approach there to write in, to research, is to compile this anthology of different moments and then let them sit next to each other to build up a picture gradually so that connections can emerge differently for every different reader. So there's different ways of studying plurality in music, different ways of studying the sounds of the 70s and of course different ways of studying music um, on the MBuzz in Music Masters programme. I hope this little mini lecture has given you just a, a tiny insight to the, the wealth of, of questioning and discussion and opportunity that we have on this course. Um, I do want to emphasise that the musicology side is only one part. Um, if you're a composer, performer, you have other interests and you're, you're thinking about studying, um, there's ample opportunity to have compositional performance focused discussions as well. But equally, thinking about how we study diversity is something that matters for all of us, no matter our, our particular interests in music studies. And now, um, now it's over to you. It would be great to hear your questions. Perhaps you've got questions about this mini lecture. Perhaps you've got broader questions about, um, about the course in general. And if there's anything I can answer now, I'll do my very best to do that. If you'd like to get in touch separately, um, please contact me. If you don't already have my email address, you can find it on the department website. It's jonathan.hicks at abdn.ac.uk. Thank you very much for attending. Thanks very much, Joe. We have a couple questions in the chat already. Um, one of the first ones being, do you think the music technology introduced in the 1970s, such as jukeboxes and vinyl records, helped shape the way people listen and engage with music? OK, fantastic question. Um, absolutely fantastic question. And uh, this is actually something that David Clark has written about. And another Clark, Eric Clark, um, has an essay on the impact of sound recording on music listening. So. What's happening here, I think, with that question is is your you're chiming in with an area of research that's already really active, which is great. And that's one of the things we do on the course. People come with their questions and then we help each other say, oh, do you know that such and such has been talking about this? And you can add that into your thinking. Um, so the short answer is yes, absolutely. I think the history of listening is bound up with the history of recording technology and that's uh, and, and sometimes we can see that in really concrete ways. So there's some famous examples, you know, when the CD is invented, you know, towards the end of the 1970s, um, it's made long enough to have the whole of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony on it. So the length of time on a CD is designed so that it can accommodate what supposedly are, you know, the great works of Western classical music. Um, much earlier than that, we have examples of people cutting to cloth, cutting the cloth to fit rather shorter time periods. So we have um, recordings uh, that are made to fit on one side of a record. So that determines how long a piece of music can be. So we have those straightforward relationships between the limits of a medium and the length of a piece of music. Much more interestingly, I think, different kinds of playback technologies allow different kinds of listening. So jukeboxes allow a very sociable kind of listening, often installed in places where people can choose what to listen to. And that becomes part of this culture of musical selection, which is kind of a performance of musical knowledge. I suppose that you choose the right thing, which chimes with your friends. They're also closely associated with a particular moment in the post-war boom and the invention of the teenager in the United States. You know, Greece in the 70s is a great example of looking back to the heyday of 
the jukebox. So the jukebox is a particular example. If we were to look a bit further forward in time, Walkmans, um, iPods, now listening on your phone, the ability that's given to listeners via small technology to listen in different settings, to listen on the move, to listen while exercising, beyond that now via apps like Nike Plus to coordinate their heart rate with the BPM of their music they're listening to. You know, there's huge interaction between music technologies and listening experiences. Um, I'd suggest it's actually impossible to separate the two. Um, the question then becomes, how do you study them? And I mentioned that Eric Clark article that talks about the impact of recording technologies on listening. One of the pushbacks against that argument is, uh, is the impact narrative suggests that technologies come from somewhere else, that they impact like an asteroid impact impacts on Earth. Whereas in fact, it might be the case that technologies have to develop out of existing cultural assumptions. Um, and I'll only give one more reference here because I don't want to overload you. Um, there's an amazing book on the, the history of recording by Jonathan Stern called The Audible Past. Um, and Jonathan Stern poses the question, what do tinned food, embalmed bodies and the gramophone have in common? And for Jonathan Stern, each of these three technologies or processes are obsessed with preservation preserving food, preserving corpses and preserving recorded sound. So for Stern, you can't understand the desire to use a gramophone without also understanding the desire to put sardines in a can or make sure that bodies live a long time when they're buried, not live a long time, are preserved a long time. So huge area of research, uh, absolutely the kind of topic that's frequently explored in the master's course and a great example I think of something that's interesting for many different people right whether you're a performer thinking about how you use technology how you record yourself whether you like singing with microphones or not perhaps you are a composer and you're interested in using technology perhaps you want to study the history of headphones you know lots of people have a way into this music educationalists as well who might be teaching music technology so lots of ways into that subject. Great question. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. We have two more questions. Um, the next being, do you think punk music has caused a lot of political conflict? Um, th thank you again. Great question. And I'll I'll try not to not to ramble too much. It's always funny um, presented like this when I can't see anybody's faces. So normally this would be much more of a discussion and a lot of the master's course involves discussion. So uh, sorry that you're hearing too much of me again. Short answer. Yes. Um, and and how would you study that right how would you study the relationships between punk and political conflict um you might find direct examples of politicians making pronouncements about you know the moral panic that's caused by punk musicians towards the end of the 1970s you might zero in on particular events so 1977 would typically be the year that's singled out here why is that well it's because you've got the the arrival of bands like the Sex Pistols and the Buzzcocks um, it, getting more mainstream attention, appearing on television, swearing on television, which then prompts a response. Obviously, it's intended to prompt a response and it coincides with um, the Jubilee uh, for, for Queen Elizabeth. So we have these two visions of, I'm going to say England, actually more than the UK. Um, I think a lot of a lot of punk is, is is more local than the whole of the United Kingdom in the case of the Sex Pistols um, and Buzzcocks, certainly. So you have these two visions of England, one closely associated with monarchy and empire and tradition, one associated with with revolt and a kind of um, counter cultural youth music. Um, so that's one way that you might track politics and you might find examples of politicians saying this is awful or you might find examples of libertarian politicians, quite right wing politicians saying even though I've got no time for the sex pistols and I think it's just screaming and shouting and nonsense, I will defend to my dying breath the freedom of Johnny Rotten um, to make this music because they want to defend freedom of expression. So there's no doubt that punk becomes uh, a lightning rod for various different political arguments at this point in the 1970s. But you could study it in different ways rather than looking at newspapers and reports from what politicians have said, you could look at a punk gig 
plenty of archive footage, plenty of videos, plenty of accounts. You might think of being in a crowd, being in a mosh pit, spitting at your friends as being political acts, as creating a very distinctive kind of social experience uh, and that almost seems a bit too dry and abstract and um, the point is that that's a very unusual thing to do punk created new ways of being with people new ways of hanging out associated with you know certain acts of violence certain kinds of dress with safety pins with tartan with underground venues you know i grew up in in york in north yorkshire and the sex pistols played in a venue beneath index the catalog shop um tiny little place and all by all accounts when they played their sweat stripping off the walls it's a tiny black box it was ear splittingly loud and all of that fits what you'd expect for this very particular kind of social experience that might model a form of political opposition to the status quo just in the way that a rave might model a form of political utopia um, and freedom and letting go of boundaries or disco might offer a kind of liberation or freedom for different groups in particular urban locations so there's different ways of asking the music and politics question however i am going to zip back to the examples i gave because um i want to stand up for perry como because it really struck me that while it's easy to make the Sex Pistols and punk central to stories of popular music in the 1970s, particularly in Britain, that doesn't account for all these people who were buying crooners that began their career in the 40s. Um, so there's a risk, I think, in overemphasizing the significance of punk because it seems new and oppositional and rebellious. And all those things are typically valued in music history. We often like to celebrate the, the groundbreakers and the innovators. Um, it can be much more difficult to discuss tradition and continuation. And maybe that's fine. Um, but I think it's worth bearing in mind that we ought to have approaches that can can consider both, consider that kind of plurality as well. What's the politics of Perry Como in the 1970s? Thanks again for the question. And the final question we have in the chat is, are there key music trends in the 1970s that have influenced music today? Wow. Uh, I, uh, I feel like th this is the point where in a, in a seminar, I'd say, yeah, now who in the room has got thoughts on what they might be? Um, and, and in a case, in, in a sense, like why wouldn't it be that the 1970s included trends that have influenced uh, music ever since? And and you can follow them through in different ways, right? We might stick with this with this genre analysis and say, okay, we have a history of, of punk and this kind of origin myth, of, of this you know revolting music in the 1970s and then we can talk about post-punk and then we can talk about various moments of punk revival and punk nostalgia you know you can go to camden now and have a very nice heritage fold out map to take you around punk venues so we can trace those particular histories of listening and and making new music and you could do the same for other genres you could obviously talk about disco you could talk about classic rock you could talk about folk rock Rock. you could talk about all sorts of music or you might look for for classical music for instance you might say what was happening in the 1970s that has continued to influence the way that people make new music and there the discussion might be slightly different there's there's a school of thought that says the 1970s marks a return of tonality I don't think it ever went away really um, but the idea is that after the second world war in places like Darmstadt there's attempts within the classical music world to find new ways of composing that reject tradition reject tonality invest heavily in serialism as a way of controlling not only pitch but timbre and rhythm and all the facets of music and then it seems by the 1970s um, there's already been a pushback against this and um, there's lots of different reference points here whether it's to music like thinking of of schnitke working in the ussr whose music uh, at times seems to pastiche late romantic composition whether you're thinking of minimalism perhaps in the ussr perhaps in the united states or in europe which is so tonal except it 
can lack leading notes so it develops a different kind of, uh, of, of tonality and that interest in simplicity or repetition um, it may well be something that's continued to be hugely influential so yeah I, I think we can we can develop strands of influence and then my follow-up question would be again to to think about this balance between innovation and continuation you know do we privilege innovation and then following who it's influenced as a kind of proof that it mattered you know this music mattered because people went on to talk about it um, the velvet underground is the favorite you know the the famous kind of alternative uh, pop music example here no one bought uh, the velvet underground and nico when it was first released but says brian eno everyone who bought it went on to form a band so this music was you know, the definition of underground not many people bought it it wasn't in the mainstream to start with but it influenced creative individuals who went on to make more music who went on to find bigger audiences so there's narratives like that um but absolutely absolutely i think how can you understand the present without understanding the past and you can identify that as how the 1970s influenced the present day i think more broadly it's a question of how we understand music history in general as, as a as a process that is continuous and isn't always steady. There can be leaps in terms of musical change. There can be loops in terms of musical references to what's happened before and then are reimagined. Um, so yeah, another example, I think, of a, of a great topic, the topic that we can introduce in a course about how we study music, how we research, and then see where it leads us. So what the Masters gives you is these opportunities um, to really take a step back and think what we're doing when we're studying music, when we're making music, when we're performing. Um, how might we learn from other examples, other kinds of research, other kinds of practice? Um, and how might we develop our own interests? Thanks again for the question. Thank you, Joe. There's just been one more question that's come in. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I think they might be wanting to get your thoughts on this, but there's a note about the development of the synthesizer, e.g. with ELP samples, music tech in the 70s leading to home studio recording. So I think they're looking to maybe get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I mean, that to me is, is, is a great example of how, you know, you introduce the possibility that we make connections by um, by thinking about music technology and then you bring in your knowledge. I, I'm willing to bet you know more about uh, the development of synthesizers and the development of home recording than I do. I'm not an authority here. Um, and in, in many cases, those of us who, who run the master's courses, of course, we bring our own expertise, but we also encourage each of you to develop your own skills as researchers and as communicators of research. So in this situation, I'd say this is great, right? You're onto something. So tell us more. Tell us more about that development of the synthesizer. Who's involved with it? What are the institutions? Perhaps with synthesizers, you get unlikely combinations. You're talking about telephone companies as well as musicians. Um, uh, and then who uses it? Who's it being marketed to? Is it a synthesizer that's being used by Stevie Wonder? Is it a synthesizer that's being used by Pierre Boulez? Is it a synthesizer that's being used by musicians who aren't very well known, but created a significant musical scene in a particular place all the, all these questions um flow from from these acts of research and these acts of sharing your research to prompt new ideas and new avenues of inquiry so i i don't actually know much about that topic but i think it's great that you do and you're interested and i'd love to know more Perfect, thank you. And in general, there's been a few people in the chat just thanking you for your presentation, saying there was some really good insights and um, thank you for your in-depth explanations on their questions. So thank you to everyone as well in the chat for asking some really interesting questions today. Absolutely, thank you very much. There currently is, oh wait, do we have another? Oh, um, that person, Alan, who asked that question is just saying good points, thank you, uh, regarding the synthesizer. <laughs> Uh, I think we don't have any more questions in the chat, so I think we'll just get to closing remarks. Fantastic. Well, my closing remarks are very simple. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope it was nice to hear a little bit about the sounds of the 70s. Um, I do want to stress that ordinarily, master's classes are a lot more discursive. It's not 
all about a lecturer telling you things and you taking down your notes. Um, it's about a combination of, of the lecturers or, or course leaders sharing information, offering approaches, um, giving you a way of, of getting into a topic. And then there's, a, there's more of an emphasis in the master's course than at undergraduate level about people in the class participating, bringing their own ideas, following their own interests. So if that's a way of working that, that chimes with you, then it could be a really a really good opportunity, um, regardless of, of of whether you think of yourself as someone who wants to study music history or someone who wants to develop your compositional voice or develop as a performer or develop your practice as a community musician. Um, there's all sorts of opportunities there, um, and I'm, the last thing I want to say is do get in touch if you if you're curious, if you've got questions, um, practical, specific, general. You might think it's a really basic question. It's probably not. Just just let me know, drop me an email. Always happy to have a chat um, and, and tell you more about the different courses in the master's programme and, and how it all works really.